So I would like to start by thanking the Iran Heritage Foundation for kindly inviting me to present today at this timely and important conference on the significance and future of Tepe Siolk. I was fortunate enough to conduct an archaeological survey in the Sialk area in January 2005 as part of the Sialk Reconsideration Project headed by Sadak Malak Shamirzadeh. While this survey was unfortunately discontinued in 2006, my experiences in the Sialk Kashan area exerted a profound influence on my thinking on ancient Iran. The first part of this presentation takes the form of a personal reminiscence of work at Sialk with Malak Shamirzadeh and many other colleagues, some of whom are here today. I finish with a discussion of the profound role Sialk has played in shaping our understanding of ancient Iran and in shaping research trajectories for an 80-year period. It was a real monumental project in that regard. And how this relates to another influential archaeological site, Hassan Lutepe, in Iran's western Azerbaijan province, just south of Lake Urmia. When I reflect on the significance of Tepe Siolk within Iranian archaeology and, more generally, the archaeology of the ancient Near East, my mind first turns to the site's contributions to our understandings of the origins of the early Iron Age and theories on Indo-European, or more specifically, Indo-Iranian and Iranian migrations, as opposed to earlier prehistoric periods that we've been hearing about. This is rooted in the pioneering excavations and seminal writings of Roman Gershman, mentioned by John Curtis earlier. Gershman's work at Sialk in 1933-34 and in 1937 followed close on his and Contineau's earlier excavations at Gian Tepe in Luristan province, which were conducted in 1931-32. Following his work at Sialk, Gershman sought to synthesize archaeological knowledge of Eastern and Western Iranian cultural developments, paving the way for decades of theorizing on ancient migrations or, as is the vogue in current anthropological parlance, processes of demic diffusion. I have spent the last several years following Gershman's tracks, as it were, reanalyzing some of the evidence drawn upon to support these theories. Just as the Sialk excavations were a watershed moment in Iranian archaeology and definitions of the early Iron Age, so too, so too were the later excavations at Hassan Lutepe, which in effect formed the next major chapter in this line of research, along with Etzat Negaban's discoveries at Marlik. As I will show, the explorations and interpretations of Hassan Lu and neighboring sites such as Dinka Tepe were heavily influenced or strongly biased by Gershman's interpretations of the late second and early first millennium cemeteries of Sialk, known as Necropolis A and Necropolis B, or Sialk 5 and 6, which are on the lower areas of the mound in gardens today. Only in more recent times has this contribution been reassessed to refine our understanding of this crucially important period across Western Iran. I'll be talking a little bit about the environmental diversity of the, the, the region. My survey took in a 30 kilometer radius area around Kashan and I think it, what's impressive here is just how much environmental diversity was included in that particular survey area. Sealk stands as a testament to the rich dynamics of highland-lowland interactions. The site's location controlling multiple ecological zones within a tightly bound site catchment provides a rich data set on cultural responses to verticality unrivaled in world archaeology with the notable exceptions of the Andes and the Himalayas. Nima Nezafati and the Sialk Reconsideration Project explored the exploitation of the mineralogical wealth of the upland zone while I was there. My work was perhaps somewhat more prosaic in comparison to ancient mining practices, given that my interests were the use of this region by pastoralists. Our survey found abundant evidence of pastoral production in the narrow intermontane valleys of Sialk spanning many millennia. One compelling example of the longevity of the use of this zone was this cave site, which showed traces of probable pre-ceramic Neolithic use as well as late medieval habitation of the 12th and 13th century, and it contained two meters of deposits. It remains unexplored. In this zone, well-watered tracts of arable land are used to produce fruit and nut crops as well as timber. Perhaps less obvious is the contribution this region makes to the arid Kashan Plain in the form of irrigation water. 
Intricate water harvesting systems of above ground and subterranean channels or jubes are used to harvest rainfall and snow melt and directed eastward to vast subterranean Kanat systems to feed the city of Kashan and the very famous Bagi Fin. These Kanats have traditionally provided a reliable water supply to the city of Kashan and its precursors. The aerial photo on the right taken by the famous pilot archaeologist and explorer Erich Schmidt, shows the area of the north mound of Sealk, or the south mound of Sealk, and nearby Kanat systems as they appeared in the early 20th century. And these are incredible engineering feats, to be sure. The Sealk survey followed these irrigation networks down from the mountains into the neighboring Piedmont zone and the plain of Kashan. Here we see one of the shafts as it appeared in 2005. In some cases, we descended into the subterranean channels. Ceramic sherds generally provided dates of the 12th and 13th centuries and later time periods. Local tradition suggested at least Sasanian dates for the early use of these kanats, of course. And this is not surprising, and they probably date back to as early as the Achaemenid period, although we did not find any evidence of that. In the Piedmont zone, we documented abundant evidence of settlement dating from the 12th, 13th centuries up through the early modern era, as well as prehistoric sites, and I was most impressed by this landscape. Interestingly, we did not find bronze and early Iron Age sites in this area. Here we see a typical fortified caravanserai or perhaps a small fortress or rabat, and such sites were typical throughout the area. And here we see a well-preserved mill Again, the hydraulic works associated with these sites are quite impressive. And finally, here another fortified historic site of the early modern era. And these sites are very much at risk for destruction as Sealk, or Kashan rather, is expanding outward. And everywhere that we went, we recovered an amazing sample of glazed ceramics from these and other sites spanning the last nine centuries. And this is hardly surprising given the role of Kashan as a center of ceramic production. The majority of the finds belong to the Seljuk, Safavid, Qajar, and modern era, the major periods of the city of Kashan as opposed to Sialk. In some, in all environmental zones, we found abundant evidence of medieval and early modern occupation. And we also documented the destruction of this landscape, particularly on the outskirts of Kashan, where new development had damaged or destroyed prehistoric sites, such as the highly important mound of Tepe Shirabe. Here you see construction work that had disturbed a medieval site not far from Tepe Shirabe. In a single day's survey, we could start our morning in the Carcass Mountains, working our way down through the hilly Piedmont to the plain of Kashan, and end our day in the arid salt flats and dunes of the western fringes of the Dashti Kavr an area known locally as the Rig Boland, or High Sands. The contrasts were very striking to me, having worked in Syria previously for 20 years. Here we found evidence for prehistoric hunter-gatherer exploitation of steppe resources, as well as caravanserais and watchtowers of the medieval and early modern periods. Survey conditions here were ideal in terms of surface visibility, but surface finds were often very few and far between. And we would start the day in the, in the snow, in the, in the Carcass Mountains, and end the day looking at a very different set of fauna as well. I really loved doing survey out in this area. And then to kind of give you some idea of the survey, the survey zone that I was working on, here's the impressive view looking westward across the various zones of the survey area for the Sea Elk Reconsideration Project. I think it really sort of shows just how much environmental diversity we were up against. I was frustrated in my attempt to identify bronze and early Iron Age sites in the Sea Elk region in 2005, and here is why. Um, conditions during our survey season were not always ideal. This photo sums up the closing days of the early January 2005 season. I had ample lab time to analyze our survey finds, and this has been the only time in my career I have worked in as a, in, in archaeological survey in, in snowstorms. It was uh, uh, not what I was expecting when I, went, when I went to Iran in 2005. It was very cold. 
Following my field work at Sea Elk, I took on the task of producing the final publications of the University of Pennsylvania's excavations at Hassan Lutepe, directed by Robert H. Dyson between 1956 and 1977. In many ways, this repeatedly brought me back to Sea Elk Tepe, at least in a literary sense. The first major task was to reassess the period known as Hassan Lu V, or the Iron One period, which is roughly contemporary to Sea Elk period V, or one of the cemeteries at Sea Elk, excavated by Gershman. There we go. Like other scholars of ancient Iran, Dyson drew heavily on the pioneering work of Gershman at Tepe Sea Elk and the Sealk sequence, which this is from the, the sequences from, from the Sealk project. Dyson also relied on Tereng Tepe, excavated in 1931, Hisar, also 1931, Shah Tepe, 1933, at Gershman's renewal of work at Susa, begun in 1946, and other sites such as Goy Tepe BA and Kurvin Chandar, but especially the graves of Sealk A and B. They were fundamental to his definition of the early Iron Age. My research, published in 2013 in the volume Hassan Lu V, the Late Bronze and Iron I period, shows the cross-sequence comparisons that underpinned Dyson and T. Kyler Young, his students' definitions of the Iron I period, or earliest Iron Age, were often very tenuous and ultimately resulted in the conflation of a 500-year period within a single archaeological period. The so-called, uh, excuse me, year period in the creation of an artificial chronological gap in Western Iran dividing the so-called Late Bronze Age from the earliest Iron Age. This artificial gap was interpreted as the result of mass migrations in the later second millennium BC, bringing Indo-Iranian and Iranian populations. But this gap stemmed from problematic methodology, the complete, incomplete nature of the evidence available at the time, mostly from the 1930s, and the profound influence that Gershman, Dyson, and Young had on later scholarship. If we're going to address demic diffusion and processes of migration, which I feel migration is a natural cultural process, I would be more surprised to find that there was not demic diffusion in antiquity. It's a natural cultural process. We need much better chronological frameworks to investigate it from a bioarchaeological perspective or from the standpoint of cultural history. For Dyson and his students, Sealk and Gion provided rare published grave groups of the late second and early first millennia. But these graves were of somewhat limited value given their highly flexible internal chronologies, relative chronology, and floating absolute dating, which was reliant on comparisons to Mesopotamia. Most critical to my examination today are the graves of Sealk A, or period five. Gershman had excavated 15 tombs in Necropolis A, containing a monochrome gray to black burnished ware, shown here on the lower part of the picture, in some typical forms. Gershman was aware of strong similarities early on between Sealk A and commercially excavated material from the so-called Soldus Necropolis, also known as Hassan Lu. Here we see Gershman's publication of some of this Hassan Lu mortuary material discovered in 1933 through 35. And this put Hassan Lu very much in the spotlight for future investigations of this grayware phenomenon and the origins of the early Iron Age. We owe a lot to Roman Gershman for that. In Sealk A, Tomb 4, Gershman found an iron dagger and an iron punch, in quotes. These iron objects stood out from the ubiquitous bronze items in the graves of Necropolis A, much like early iron finds with grayware uh, stood out in northwestern Iran. The graves of Tepe Gion I, as originally defined graves 1 through 63 in Gershman and Contineau's excavations, had already yielded burnished gray and dark red ceramics sim similar to those recovered from Sealk A and Hassan Lu. The Gion I graves contained copper bronze artifacts and three iron daggers from tombs 3, 5, and 23, respectively. Gershman reasoned that the scarcity of iron indicated that this ceramic horizon, typified by burnished gray blackware, dated to the end of the Bronze Age, rightly so. 
Sealog Cemetery B, or period six, located some distance from Cemetery A and possibly separated temporally by a hiatus of unknown duration, provided evidence of a significantly different material culture with painted ceramics, little burnished gray blackware, and a higher incidence of iron. As we know, to Gierschmann, this indicated a new culture and a second wave of immigrants. Very important to the chronology, Gierschmann originally dated Sea Alk A to 1400 to 1200 BC, which is fairly accurate, and Sea Alk B to no earlier than 1200 to 1100 BC. This was fairly good for Sea Alk A, but he later revised his dating of Sea Alk A to 1200 to 1000 BC, linking the phase to the graves of Gion I, specifically Gion I, IV, and I, III which in turn were compared to graves at Babylon dated to the 12th and 11th century. These far-flung cross-sequence comparisons really set the chronology of Iran for a long period of time. Gershman also noted similarities between Sealk A, gray black burnished vessels with white infilled incised designs with the red arrows and similar wares from the Caucasus where such material was at the time erroneously dated to around 1000 BC. And this also had a profound impact on chronologies in Iran. This reinforced this inaccurate dating. And these vessels now we know are more popularly known as Middle Bronze III and late bron early Late Bronze Age and are best known from the Metsamor Lakashin archeological complex or in Kurdistan from sites like Tel Shamlu of the late Old Babylonian and post Old Babylonian period. Very diagnostic. Gershman thus revised the start date, sorry. Gershman thus rev rev revised the start date of Sealk B, assigning it to a date of 1000 BC in light of the dating of the earlier Sealk A, based also on a Neo Assyrian cylinder seal found in one Sealk B tomb and his belief that Sialk B, archeological culture, represented the Medes, who are first mentioned in the records of Assyria in 834 BC. Gershman therefore asserted that the start of Sialk B must predate this mention. As early as 1948, Claude Schaeffer, in his monumental Stratigraphie Comparée et Chronologie, had questioned the logic of Gershman's dating, preferring a range of 1400 to 1200 BC for Sialk A and 1250 to 1100 BC for Sialk B. But as Dyson, Young, Inna Medvedskaya, and others have shown, this dating of Sialk B cannot be maintained. The association of gray to black monochrome burnished pottery with early iron objects, as well as Gershman's grouping of the Sialk A graves into a single period, would heavily influence later scholars, as would his migrationist theories of culture change driven by multiple waves of migrants. Gershman, building on the work of Arne, issued a statement in 1939 that would reverberate in Iranian archaeology for decades to come. To quote, what are the reasons that caused the displacement of the civilization represented by Necropolis A and its appearance at Sialk, Ray, and at Gion? Arne believes it is the Indo-European invasion which ended the age of gray-black pottery, which had flowered in the Turkoman plain, which is possible but with the condition of lowering the date that he gives to the layers of Shah Tepe. At Tereng Tepe, the most recent level three shows a radical change in burial practices. On Mound C, at the end of its occupation, the dead were no longer buried under dwellings, but as at Sealk, Necropolis A, in a necropolis apart from the houses, an important cultural attribute assigned to the early Iron Age. Two of these tombs contain small iron objects which makes it possible to believe they are contemporary to Necropolis A. At Damgan, or Hisar, one does not note similar changes, but level 3B there underwent a violent destruction, and the most recent installation, 3C, represents several characteristics that link it to the civilization of the Caucasus and southern Russia. Gershman thus highlighted certain archaeological correlates of putative early Iron Age migrations, whether directly or indirectly linked grayware, small amounts of iron, and extramural cemeteries. Iranian archaeology would subsequently be dominated by theories attempting to connect the dots of Iranian migration, as talked about by scholars such as Musavi in 2005. The primary data often consisted of material salvaged from looted cemeteries, such as Hassanlu and Kurvin, 
which proved difficult to date. The area of the Elburs and the Caspian littoral proved sparse territory for archaeologists in search of this grayware culture or horizon, resulting in a stubborn spatiotemporal gap for those attempting to link eastern grayware to its supposed western cousin. In the Hassan Lu project, published in Science in 1962, Dyson explicitly laid out his criteria for the relative and absolute dating of the earliest Iron Age, or as he called it, the button base phase, or Hassan Lu period five. The example chosen to illustrate the technique of cross-sequence dating was a Hassan Lu five grayware goblet, or tankard, which was compared to examples recovered from Siok A, Gyan One, and Goytepe B. So we see Gershman's influence. Dyson was gradually shifting to an Iranian focus for Comparanda, foreshadowing Young's more detailed cross-sequence comparison published in 1963 and 1965 in the eventual edition of Columned Hall Architecture as a diagnostic of the earliest Iron Age. Dyson writes, such similarities relate the ceramics of this phase, Hassan Lu V, to the general tradition of central and western Iran. I won't read the rest of the quote, but also to Mesopotamia. And this was a very important moment when they were beginning to move away from what they understood about Mesopotamia to date Iranian material towards an archaeology of Iran in the Northwest. Dyson continued to develop this idea further, eventually designating an archaeological grayware horizon in Western Iran. Kyler Young provided a detailed definition of the early Western Gray Horizon, which was supported by an exhaustive review of the available archaeological evidence and included Hassan Lu V, Gion I, Siok V, Goy Tepe, and Corvin Chandar. Young wrote that, quote, all of these sites share three general features. They have essentially a mixed plain gray and buffware assemblage in which painted ware occurs only very rarely. They display a similar burial tradition in regard to extramural cemeteries, and they only rarely yield objects of iron. It sounds just like Gershman from quite a bit earlier. He later added Colin Hall architecture to this assessment of culture traits for Western Iran. Young's essentialist definition of the earliest Iron Age originated and expanded upon Gershman's description of Sialk A. As Gershman before him, Young rather precariously linked this horizon to Hisar III in northeastern Iran, where a type of grayware was well known. This became the basis of, for Young's theory centered on an east-west migration of Iranian populations in the second millennium BC, although chronological and spatial gaps between Hisar III and this early western grayware horizon would prove difficult, if not po impossible, to reconcile. After a review of the evidence, I contend the prolonged and dogged adherence to early western grayware migration theories or the slightly watered down notion of punctuated demic diffusion stem from two sources. The first is what Karl Popper coined the Oedipus effect in the social sciences in his critique of historicism, uh, in which he noted that, as is the case here, prediction influences the predicted. This is easily, tra easily traced back to Gershman's early grappling with Sialk A, in which he popularized a list of putative cultural traits and a multiple wave migra migrationist model that promised to explicate the arrival of Iranian populations on the plateau, their movements, displaced this affiliated grayware, uh, gray Sialk A culture, and their eventual arrival was heralded by Sialk B and buffware ceramics. As Western Iran was further explored, the predictive model profoundly influenced data collection and interpretation, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Herein rests the reasoning, to my mind, for the origin of and adherence to, adherence to the unconventional use of the term Iron Age in Iran, which in its earliest applications at Sialk A and Hassan Lu V lumped together the Middle Bronze III, the Late Bronze Age, and the Iron I period, or the late 16th century BC to the 11th century. Hassan Lu and Sialk, both sites provide critical information on the later second millennium. Uh, they have closely interrated data sets that remain very poorly understood. In conclusion, the so-called Western grayware culture became inextric inextricably linked to Dyson's definition of the early Iron Age, the earliest Iron Age, which in turn linked, was linked to Indo-Iranian migrations, a la T. Kyler Young, and for a time it seemed that Persians, Medes, and Scythians might have had a much earlier and easily discernible presence in Iran. Sites such as Sialk and Hassan Lu are key to our understanding of Iran's past, 
and new exploration and reanalysis of older results will have much to offer. The outstanding universal value of these sites and their surrounding areas are manifest to my mind, and we must do all we can to preserve these sites and their surrounding fragile landscapes for future generations. Thank you very much.